What's up, folks? Tis I, Tim Anderson, a.k.a. Renfell, the Bearded Dwarven Princess. And you know what time it is? It is time for the next episode of Mondays in Middle-Earth. We have now started into The Two Towers, which is my favorite book. And oh man, what an introduction. Like the first two chapters... I gotta pull up my notes right now. That's what I'm doing. The first two chapters are pretty intense. We get right into it, and it's just like not even. There's no break. There's no breathing room. It's just boom, back into the action. Um, today we're gonna be covering book three, chapter one, the departure of Boromir, as well as chapter two. Which I gotta pull up my other notes here. What is chapter two called? The Riders of Rohan, I believe. Yes. Okay. So, if you haven't followed the previous episodes of this, don't forget to check um, them out in the playlist. You can also go over to our Discord, and in our Discord server for the Wandering Hermits, there's a section dedicated to this series called Mondays in Middle-Earth, if you want to see conversations and discussions about previous episodes. But we've just gone through The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, and now we're into the Two Towers as we continue our march towards the Rings of Power. We're going to try to get through all these books and the Silmarillion. I don't know if it's going to happen before Rings of Power, but it's something that I'm working on because I hadn't read these books in 20 years. So, Book 3, Chapter 1, The Departure of Boromir. Um, the, the chapter just starts off right where we left off because I remember these books were originally written as one book and the publisher split them up. So we literally are here where Aragorn is dealing with the stress of um you know where are the hobbits etc then he hears the horn of boromir and he has this decision where he's like do i go or do i run up to the top and look out over the land because i wanted to have some time to meditate here because it's a place precious to my people and of course ultimately he decides i gotta get up the stairs and and do this um, so he runs up and as he's looking out over the landscape um he has this feeling of like Ah, woe is me. Like, he literally cries out, An ill fate is on me this day, and all that I do goes amiss. I mean, he's just... He's lost Gandalf. The hobbits are missing. The Horn of Boromir is going off. Horn of Gondor. And he's just feeling absolute stress at this point. Um, now, obviously he runs back down the hill, and we get to the fall of Boromir. Now... As powerful as this scene is in the book, I much prefer the way they did it in the film. I've seen these movies, I don't know, probably 40, 40 times in my lifetime. I've seen them a lot. And I cry every time the death sequence with Boromir. The way, you know, I would have followed you, my brother, my captain, my king. Like when he finally, you know, and I will not let the I will not let the white city fall. Like Aragorn's speech to Boromir as he's lying there and with Boromir's dying breath, he's like, Oh, my brother, my captain, my king. It's such an epic sequence, and I think they did a really good job with the writing. But um in the book, we get this dialogue sequence that is very intense, and it's obviously very powerful in an emotional moment. Um, but it is what it is, you know. It's just it's it's the passing of a man who was a very a very very amazing individual, and he just got corrupted by the ring. And there's nothing shameful in that, you know what I mean? Like it's not something to be ashamed of it's just an unfortunate side effect of the power of the ring even the strongest like gandalf himself says nah i won't touch it like mm -mm. and galadriel's like i passed the test like i don't want it like it's this thing where even the greatest could fall if they were to touch it and and use it with good intentions um as boromir dies we get Aragorn is continuing the self-pity, but also just righteous anger. He's he's basically this dialogue sequence about how vain was Gandalf's trust in me. You know, he's got this self-doubt creeping in after the loss of Gandalf. And then here we've got the fact that Boromir's dead. At least two of the hobbits have been taken, or maybe more. He doesn't know which hobbits have been taken at this point. And this is when they begin to search the bodies of the fallen orcs. And Legolas is pulling the arrows out. And he's like, wait a second, I don't recognize these. Um, these are from the Northern Orcs, and I said, but these are not Orcs of Mordor right here. Um, there's, they've got this strange marking, um, etc. 
And they're described as goblin soldiers of greater stature, and upon their shields was a small white hand in the center of a black field, and on the front of their iron helms was a rune, an S rune, wrought of white metal. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we know who this is, but, you know, if this is your first time reading through the book, spoiler alert, Saruman. <laughs> Uh, we get a very Viking burial sequence here for Boromir. Um, they, I mean, there's there's a great lot of dialogue here that I'm kind of s skipping over in the sense that they're say we can't do this, we can't we can't put up a carn, we can't bury him, we got to hurry up, we got to get on the road, we got to figure out who's gone where, where are the hobbits and all this other stuff. But they do decide that we can get him back to the boats, um, and they arrange him in the boat with his all of his gear and his kit, and also at the feet of his at the feet. Um, all the, the, the swords of his enemies. So it's a very Viking burial sequence here. And then they shove him off down the river. And it's a very emotional... I'm actually getting goosebumps as I read this. There's a, the, the way it's written... Um, Boromir, son of Denethor, was not again seen in Minas Tirith, standing as he used to stand upon the white tower in the morning. But it was said after the elven boat rode the falls in the foaming pool and bore him down the river and passed the many miles of anduin and he floated out into the great sea at night under the stars it's just a really great line of dialogue about boromir son of denethor and and i'm actually getting a little emotional like thinking about it right now like boromir was a really cool character and a lot of people just like he was corrupt there's so much more to boromir especially if you get into the history of, of his character um we get a little bit more of that in the next chapter actually when we're talking to Amor, which i do cover in in this so we're gonna we're gonna move on we now get another series because remember tolkien was a poet at heart and a writer so we get this really epic poem series of poems aragorn starts to sing a song followed by legolas and then aragorn again um, and this is after they sing the song this is when they go back to the landing and aragorn starts to search the tracks and realizes oh Frodo's gone by boat, and Sam went with him, which means the hobbits that Boromir was talking about had to have been Merry and Pippin. Um, and this is where they basically decide that, well, we're just going to have to let Frodo go, and we're going to have to try to, you know, uh, get... We can't leave Merry and Pippin to be tortured by the enemy. Um, Legolas then shouts out, you know, hunting orcs, and... and uh, where is this said his... Oh, oh, Frodo wonders here. There's a section here. I was reading my own notes going, how did I, what did I mean here? Legolas wonders if Frodo was fleeing from the hunting orcs. And Aragorn responds and says, he fled certainly, but not, I think, from orcs. But what's interesting is that it says here that, that the cause of Frodo's sudden resolve in flight, he did not say. The last words of Boromir, he long kept secret. Because, of course, Boromir told him when he was dying, you know, I tried to take the ring from Frodo. You know, he admitted his, his wrongs. Um, this is a really cool speech at the end of this chapter. Um, Aragorn, when he finally decides to go after Mary Pippin, he's like, we're going to make such a chase as shall, as shall be accounted a marvel among the three kindreds, elves, dwarves, and men. Forth the three hunters. And that's the end of the chapter. It's just like, oh, shit. Now, that chapter is relatively short because the writers of Rohan was so big that I had to split it up into two memos in 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 my uh, in my notes here. So the writers of Rohan, which is chapter two, is a really big chapter. Uh, we're gonna get into this here. Um, so they just start running at night, right? And they're scrambling through the bony lands. It says climbing to the crest of the first and tallest ridge, and then down again into the darkness of the deep winding valley on the other side. And they only took a rest in the cool hour before dawn. They do lose the trail briefly before they come upon some orc bodies, and they've been hacked apart, brutally beheaded, um, and Ergon makes an assumption that these must, um, because these are northern orcs, they must have been killed by the strange ones with badges, which they assume are sent by Saruman. They're not wrong in that assumption, but... Then as the sun rises, they see off to the left 30 leagues or more of the White Mountains, and Aragorn cries out, Gondor, Gondor, would that I looked upon you again in a happier hour, and then he sings a song about Gondor before they turn and continue following the trail of the orcs and hobbits. Legolas sees a great eagle high, high, high up in the sky, so high that, Gan that uh, Aragorn himself cannot see it. But he does see something moving across the plains, a great company on foot 12 weeks away at least. And then as they reach the, the grass, this is a really cool part. Um, 
uh, where Legolas takes a deep breath, like one that drinks a great draught after a long, there's a, a long thirsty time in barren places, and says, the green smell, it's much better than sleep. Let us run! And we get this thing where it says they spring forth like hounds with a strong scent and an, e and an eager light in their eyes. Um, and they're running rapidly until Aragorn finally cries out and says, wait, 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 because he sees some tracks going off into the brush. And this is where we get the um, sequence where he finds the fallen brooch um, dropped by Pippin. And, you know, we get the dialogue sequence of not idly do the leaves of Lothlorien fall. So we know that obviously Merry and Pippin are alive at this point and cognizant and dropping clues to say, hey, we're still alive, which gives Aragorn and them hope. We do get assistance of time at this point. They've ran for 24 hours, and at least 12 leagues lay between them and the west and the eastern wall where they had stood at dawn. Um, and we also get this commentary here about orcs seldom travel in the open sun, yet these have done so and were certainly not rest by night. And then we finally get a point where Gimli's like, look, guys, I'm strong, I'm tough, I'm a badass, but I, I need a break. Like, this is just, this is too much. Can we please just rest a little bit? Um, they wake the next morning and Legolas is basically complaining that the orcs have traveled all night. There's no way they're going to catch up with them. Aragorn then casts himself down upon the ground and with his ear to the dirt for so long that the rest of the party starts to think that he's fallen asleep. And when he finally comes up, his face is troubled because he says, Faint and far are the feet of enemies, but loud are a host of horses riding northward. I wonder what is happening in this land. Um, they take another break. As they're running, Aragorn comments that there's something strange at work in the land because I am weary as I have seldom been before. No ranger should be this tired with a clear trail to follow. There is some will that gives speed to our enemies and sets an unseen barrier before us, which you know is Saruman. Saruman is literally like, I've got the ring! Because he literally thinks that these two hobbits have the ring and his orcs have been told, bring the hobbits, you know? So he is doing everything he can to block Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli, or anyone from pursuit. Um, so this is there's something super cool that I completely do not remember from the books at all. Don't remember this at all. But there's a section here. It's not in the films. This is only in the books. Um, so I, I, I do not remember this at all. It, it says that Legolas could sleep if sleep it could be... Hang on a second, let me repeat this. Legolas could sleep, if sleep it could be called by men, by resting his mind in the strange paths of elvish dreams, even as he walked open-eyed in the light of this world. So elves don't need to sleep, apparently. Like, they can literally be present in our physical world while at the same time resting their mind in the other dimension right the, the 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 realm of the elves the immortal realm and get rest there so that their physical forms in our world never actually need sleep so freaking cool i do not remember this at all from the books that was a total and it's just a little tiny paragraph in here that you could skip over if you were skim reading so it was really really neat to see that because i was like oh that's that's cool i do not remember that at all um this is the port where we get where uh, the riders of Rohan are coming here, and Aragorn says, you know what? I'm tired. Our hunt has failed. These horsemen are riding back the orc trail that we're following. Might as well just wait here, because we might get some news from them. Although Gimli's tips have said we might get spears instead. Like, <laughs> you don't know that we're going to get news from them. They might decide to spear us. Um, then there's this entire sequence where they meet the riders of Rohan, and the scene from the film is almost exactly like it is in the book. Like, the dialogue that they used in the film is pulled almost verbatim from this scene in the, in the, I think it's one of the first scenes I've come across in the book that was so like it was in the films that you can just give a nod to them for saying this one was done by the book. You know, there was no real adaptation here. Um, the only difference here is that, um, I got to read this here real quick. Basically, Aragorn is so pressed for time here, and 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 as as Amor is talking about all these things and etc., uh, Aragorn is like, basically, are you going to aid me or um, uh, let me go? But before he does that, there's this sequence where Aragorn stands up and says, 
these lines and it says Gimli and Legolas look at him in amazement for they had not seen him in this way before. He seemed to have grown in stature while Aomer had shrunk and in his living face they caught a brief vision of the power and majesty of the kings of stone and for a brief moment it seemed to the eyes of Legolas that a white flame flickered on the brows of Aragorn like a shining crown. So we're getting the vision stuff again, but we're getting the importance of who Aragorn is. He is the king. He is of the line of Numenor. And he's that kingly nature is coming forth, you know, uh, aid me and forward to me swiftly. Um, this is where we get a little bit more about the Boromir stuff, because Amr, they're talking with Amr, and he's asking, you know, what happened. And, and Aragorn's telling him the story. And, 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 and they're talking about the horse that we lent, uh, Aramur says, the horse that we lent Boromir came back riderless. What doom do you bring out of the north? Um, Aragorn then explains the following, the passing of Gandalf. Then Aramur lets him know a little secret, says, hey man, he's still Shadowfax. Uh, the king is not happy with him right now. You might not want to mention that name if you go to see Theoden. Um, we also get this mention, and here was what I was talking about earlier, about Boromir's backstory. Amr has nothing but good things to say about him. He says, Boromir came seldom to the mark because he was ever on the wars in the eastern borders, and so he was familiar with them, and he was a, a well-known, a well-loved figure in in here. Now, this is where Amr is surprised because it says, they traveled 45 leagues before the first, first day had ended... How many miles is 45 leagues? I'm going to look this up real quick. Holy shit. Really? That's 135 miles. Um, what is the math on that? Um, four days. In less than four days. Right? So they had basically traveled 33 miles per day on foot. Which, like freaks Amor out. He's like, this is, you guys, wow. Like, you guys are honestly, this. you're seriously intent upon this. Um, we also get confirmation here that, that Rohan has never paid tribute to Sauron in horses. That's just a rumor. Um, then there's this really cool sequence where Amor brings up the law about how they're not supposed to allow anyone to roam the realm un unattended. So he doesn't, he's, he's debating whether or not he should accompany a Aragorn and, and, and the others as they want to go off and continue searching for the friends. And Aragorn literally says, you know what? Aid us or set us free. But if you seek to carry out your law, you're going to do so with fewer to return to your war and to your king. <laughs> and he's basically just like, dude, either aid me or let me go. But if you try to stop me, I'm going to cut some of you down on my way out. And I don't want to do that. But he's like, don't mess with me right now. Like, like, just don't do it. Just don't do it. Um, Amr then gives him the horses and tells him, you can have these. Please just return them to Theoden after you've done. And please, I would love it if you could come aid us after you finish your quest. And, and Aragorn does say, oh, absolutely. Um, we then ride to the place where we have the orc body of orc piles on the edge of Fungharn. And as they rest in the middle of the night, Gimli looks up and sees on the edge of the firelight an old man leaning on his staff and wrapped in a great, great cloak. But he did not speak and made no sign, but suddenly their horses are gone and disappeared, leaving them stranded on the edge of the forest. So we can suspect that it's none other than Saruman seeking to further hinder their search for the hobbits. Um, but just honestly, I think the Riders of Rohan chapter is my favorite chapter to, to date. Out of everything we've read so far, this has definitely been my favorite chapter because we can see just how badass our heroes are running 135 miles in four days. Like the average pace is like 20 miles a day and they did 33 miles a day because their need is so great. And just Aragorn multiple times in this chapter showing his true nature and like, get out of my way or I'm going to cut you down. I don't want to, but just aid, me, help me or get out of my way, you know? And then Legolas seeing the vision of him, and Aomer seeming to shrink in stature compared to Aragorn growing in stature. It's just a really good chapter, the Rise of Rohan chapter. Can't wait to dive into more. If you do like this, don't forget, like, subscribe, follow along, and uh, don't forget to head over to our Discord channel. Let's talk about this in greater detail, everybody. Look forward to talking to you in the next episode as we continue to read through all of the Lord of the Rings.